Key. Uh, can I uh, welcome Prime Minister John Key here to Canberra and we're very much looking forward to having him address the nation's parliament later today. Uh, when I became Prime Minister I was very determined that the relationship between Australia and New Zealand should continue to go from strength to strength. Uh, we're like family and I suppose the temptation is with those closest to you that you take their bond with you for granted instead of continuing to nurture it. I'm sure many of us have experienced that in our own lives. Uh, I was concerned we were taking some of our relationship for granted. We had not maintained the annual exchanges between leaders that we should have and so I determined that we would put that back in place and was very pleased to accept Prime Minister Key's invitation to visit New Zealand earlier this year and to have the historic opportunity to address their parliament. In the ordinary course of things, Prime Minister Key would have been in Australia next year for the annual exchange. But of course the fury of nature caused us to think again. When we experienced our natural disasters here in Australia, New Zealand boots were very quickly on the ground to give us a helping hand. And when New Zealand faced the shock of the earthquake in Christchurch, Australians were there almost immediately to provide a helping hand. And given what our friends in New Zealand have been through with Christchurch, the aftershocks, the distress that is still there, I believed it appropriate to ask Prime Minister Key to visit us now and to address the Parliament today, and I thank him for accepting that invitation. In the lead up to his parliamentary ad address, we've had the opportunity to talk about some important connections between our countries. When I spoke to the New Zealand Parliament, I said we had to remain active and engaged on reforming our economies, on uniting our two countries across the Tasman and reaching out beyond our two nations together to the world. We've taken some steps on each of those during the course of our discussions. On reforming our economies, we've agreed to establish a single Australia-New Zealand Therapeutic Products Agency. It's another step forward in the closer economic integration of our two economies. We've also determined to uh, keep working on the smart gate system which is the technology which would enable travelling between Australia and New Zealand to feel like a domestic flight experience. Uh, in terms of uniting ourselves across the Tasman, uh, we've determined that we will have officials work together on linking our emissions trading schemes. Of course, New Zealand prices carbon. It has an emissions trading scheme which is working successfully. New Zealand's in front. Uh, we will catch up. We'll show the same determination they have and we will have officials working together on linking the two schemes on working together to have our voices heard in the world and to deal with global problems. New Zealand is hosting the Pacific Island Forum a little bit later this year, very closely associated with the World Cup, about which we're anticipating a very major difference of opinion. Uh, but we will be going into the Pacific Island Forum together uh, with a united view about working in a spirit of friendship and partnership across the Pacific. Uh, we will, of course, see events in our region later this year, the East Asia Summit, APEC, and of course the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting here in Perth later in the year. And we continue to share uh, the work in Afghanistan as we are committed, so New Zealand is committed to seeing the mission through in Afghanistan. Uh, finally, I'd like to conclude by saying we've discussed a very special centenary which is coming up, uh, the word ANZAC define so much about both our nations and of course the centenary of Gallipoli and where the Anzac legend was born is coming upon us. We need to make appropriate preparations now for 2015. Here in Australia we will shortly be forming an advisory board to guide the commemorations of the centenary of Gallipoli 
uh, we will want to work with New Zealand as we put those events together and have uh, its advisory structures work with us so that some of these commemorations happen in each nation, but some of these commemorations happen together as the word ANZAC properly implies they should. And I am pleased to announce today that design work will commence soon for an Australian memorial in the pr proposed New Zealand Memorial Park in Wellington, and we've begun to work together to plan for the Gallipoli Dawn service in 2015. So with those words of opening about our discussion and with a genuine spirit of welcome, I'll turn to Prime Minister Key for some remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Julia, thanks very much. Can, firstly, can I just say how uh, wonderful it is to be here in Australia. Um, Julia, I want to thank you actually for your commitment and your warmth to the relationship between New Zealand and Australia. Uh, it's a very genuine commitment and uh, our two countries are in stronger shape uh, because of it. It's a real honour to have the privilege of being the first New Zealand Prime Minister to speak in the Australian Parliament. Uh, it's a great opportunity for New Zealand to put on the record uh, the relationship with Australia, uh, the strengths and the opportunities that lie before uh, both countries. Um, I think it was entirely fitting that the first uh, international Prime Minister to speak uh, in our Parliament came from Australia. And um, Julia, I think you gave a stunning speech uh, in our Parliament. You set the benchmark pretty high, uh, but we'll see if we can reciprocate this afternoon. But it was uh, a real expression of the warmth and the family uh, that is Australia and New Zealand. So I appreciate that, and it was great that you come over. I do want to express my gratitude to the people of uh, Australia for the way that they've responded to uh, the disasters that we've had in New Zealand. Obviously, the Pike River Mine disaster last year, the two earthquakes that have taken place, uh, it was extremely comforting to have not only the financial support of the people of Australia, uh, but actually their technical expertise uh, and their goodwill. And to feel that New Zealand wasn't isolated and on its own as it was dealing with uh, some of the worst natural disasters we've ever had uh, was very encouraging and I'm very grateful for that. Just to give you a sense of the magnitude um, of those earthquakes and the impact they've had on our economy, um, on our estimates uh, this is the single biggest impact of any natural disaster on a developed economy uh, that we can find. It's going to cost in the order of 8 to 9 per cent of GDP, around about $25 billion, so it's a very major event. Uh, it's had a huge impact on the confidence of the people of Christchurch because there's been 7,500 uh, approximately 7,500 aftershocks of a magnitude of three or above uh, since the 4th of September. So it's had a big impact. Uh, but the country is coming together well. Um, the government is totally committed to the rebuild of Christchurch and we believe uh, that will occur. Uh, we've uh, fully provisioned in Budget 2011 uh, for the earthquake costs, about $5.5 billion, um, over and above the insurance and reinsurance uh, that we have. So. We're doing our best uh, to go forward. Uh, can I also say how delighted I am that we've managed to sign today uh, the uh, Australian New Zealand Therapeutics Agency and the work that our officials will undertake over the next five years. It's yet another step in the progress of uh, CER uh, between our two countries. I think we are working very hard to try and make sure that we put some practical and sensible deliverables for the people of Australia and New Zealand as a result of our work. Um, Smartgate is a great example of that. A million and a quarter Australian tourists come to New Zealand every year. Having a domestic-like experience is a real benefit for them, and equally it's true of the hundreds of thousands of New Zealanders that come across the Tasman. If we can make progress on uh, roaming charges for telecommunications, for instance, again, it's a practical reduction in cost uh, for citizens of both countries. And I think that's what um, our voters want to see. They want to see us actually making progress on things that really matter to them. Uh, so we thank you for that. In terms of the Pacific Forum, um, as the Prime Minister noted, we'll be hosting that from the 6th uh, to the 9th of September. That's the 40th uh, Pacific Forum. Uh, New Zealand and Australia uh, remain totally committed in our approach towards Fiji um, and to wanting to see a democracy restored to Fiji as fast as we possibly can. We do appreciate uh, your uh, commitment, Julia, to, uh, to building a memorial in New Zealand at our National uh, War Memorial and uh, the government's looking at its own uh, response there as well. 
Uh, and finally, just in relation to the Rugby World Cup, as you're aware, that is um, the third uh, largest sporting event in the world. Uh, we're very much looking forward to hosting that cup. Um, all indications are that if the uh, if it went the way it could do, it could well be October the 23rd in Australia New Zealand uh, final. We have been thinking about what could be a possible bet uh, for the relevant <laughs> prime. Prime Ministers to have one option we're thinking of is that uh, maybe the Prime Minister of uh, the losing country has to eat an apple from the other country <laughs> and then spend, I would say, let's say 60 seconds describing the merits and, um, and uh, benefits of that apple and why it was such a pleasurable and enjoyable experience. <laughs> so that is... Um, an interesting challenge, and all I can say is I hope the All Blacks don't lose <laughs> on that note. Anyway, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, that certainly spurred the uh, spirit of Australian yes. determination on. Uh, now, we'll take uh, questions from uh, media from each uh, country. I think uh, in the spirit of welcoming our New Zealand friends, we should probably ask a New Zealand journalist first. I'll let you uh, pick John, sure. and I'm happy to give a form guide to ours when it's their turn. Sure. Barry Soper from News Talk ZB and Prime News. Uh, Prime Minister Gillard, I'm just wondering whether you look at New Zealand and the way we've introduced our emissions trading scheme with some envy, given <laughs> the problems that you're facing in this country at the moment. He's riding high in the opinion polls and you're not. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, and I would say to the people of Australia, as we're standing here talking about all things New Zealand, uh, we uh, you know, love Kiwis, they're family for us, uh, but I think Australians would be asking themselves if the Kiwis have had the guts to go and price carbon, why can't we? Well, my answer is we can. We can catch up with our Kiwi friends. Well, this is, I should just introduce, this is Andrew Proben from our West Australian newspaper, yeah. so he'll probably ask you something about uh, resources, no? No, it's actually, not. It's, it's actually on the, the carbon price, so, I mean, and I'd like a response from the two of you. Uh, Mr Key, you've, you, your nation has introduced an ETS. Yeah. You've got uh, the last spot price of carbon was about 1950, which cruelly, because of the Australian dollar, is, is about $15 uh, Australian. Yeah. Um, what are the merits of having a low price as opposed to a high price right. uh, before there is a global agreement. And, Prime Minister, would you uh, also like to comment on whether there is merit in having a lower price rather than, the, uh, than a higher one? Yeah. Well, let me start by saying it's, it's uh, not for me to determine what's um, the right approach for Australia. That's a matter for Australian politicians. But what I can tell you about the emissions trading scheme in New Zealand is it's worked. Uh, so that's the first point. In the time that we've had it in place, all of the applications for new electricity generation have been in the renewable space. So as opposed to about 50-50 coming from thermal energy, um, that price signal has definitely sent a strong message that renewable energy makes sense. Uh, secondly, um, we are seeing a change uh, in behaviour when it comes to forestry. So we've now had a period of afforestation. We're planting more trees as opposed to what had been a substantial period of deforestation. So those price signals are working in the marketplace. We, and to specifically to your point about cost, I mean, I think we're all conscious of the impact on consumers. Uh, by pricing ours with a cap at $12.50 New Zealand, about 10 Australian at the moment, um, then we anticipate it would have an impact of about $150 per, per household per year. Uh, we're about a year on in terms of the anniversary of that, and the indications are that it is coming in at about $150 a year. Uh, we've got a review taking place in terms of when the next move is, because our scheme should theoretically click up to uh, $25 a carbon charge uh, by about 2013. Um, it's a little bit early to tell you completely about that review, although I'd say one thing I can say is that generally speaking uh, the feedback we're getting from uh, businesses and the NGO sector is that they are more positive now that the scheme is actually in place because they're confident that it gives them um, surety of investment um, and uh, we are just obviously conscious of what's happening around the world including what happens in Australia. On a single scheme with Australia, you've talked of linkages. Do you, do you see a sole market? Well, our scheme, when we came into office, um, there was an original scheme on the books um, passed by the previous Labor government. Uh, that was a much more expensive and quite intensive scheme, and we thought it had some design flaws. And we largely actually picked up the CPRS. A scheme that you are proposing over here. So it has an intensity measure, it allows companies to grow, uh, and 
it, it arguably does make sense for there to be interoperability and to be able to trade emissions across the Tasman. Now, uh, again, you know, that's something our officials are working on. Uh, but you know, our two economies are so closely related. My view as New Zealand Prime Minister has always been I wouldn't want to see um, investment decisions moving across the Tasman one way or the other, frankly, based on climate change policy. I mean, that's, that, that it would seem to defeat what is a global problem. Yes. Um, Prime Minister Key said that it was fitting for you to be the first leader to address our parliament. Uh, Prime Minister Key is the eighth uh, to address this parliament. Why has it taken so long? <laughs> I think it's the right time uh, for a New Zealand Prime Minister, Prime Minister Key, to address our Parliament. Uh, it is a rare honour to be invited to address the Australian Parliament. It is not routine, it's not the norm. Uh, we have had people like uh, uh, President Clinton, we've had Prime Minister Blair, President Hu, President Udiono, amongst others, address our Parliament, but it is a rare honour. I think it's more important this year than at any other time to extend that rare honour to the Prime Minister of New Zealand. I think our sense of family and the bonds between us were sharply reinforced this year in a time of great suffering, uh, initially in our nation, and then we turned our eyes to New Zealand as we saw the horror of Christchurch. So it gives us a moment to reflect on those events, to reflect on how we jointly responded to them to Together and to talk about the future. For one moment, then. Prime Minister Key, uh, our opposition leader Phil Goff has said that Jerry Brown is fobbing off Christchurch residents and uh, questioned whether he's up for the job. Do you think that it's his fault that there's not enough news yet for those residents? Well, I don't think Phil Goff's in a position to make those kinds of statements. Um, what I can tell you is that we are trying to deliver the best possible outcome for the people of Christchurch that are so um, badly affected by that earthquake. Now, um, as I said last week back in New Zealand, uh, we are getting much closer to identifying the land that will need to be abandoned. We understand completely the anxiety that's creating for those uh, residents. But the single most important thing we can do for them is give them clarity. And to give them clarity, we need to be able to answer all of the questions, not just whether they can rebuild or not on their, their plot of land, but ultimately what their uh, payout is in terms of the insurance companies, how that process might work, what actually happens next in terms of their existing property. What we do know is that there's in the, in the order of about 12,000 homes that are in this category of being uh, either likely to be demolished. Now, some of that land will be able to re be rebuilt and some will not. And I really think it's uh, in the interest of everyone for us to hold our breaths and for us to get through and give uh, the people of Christchurch a finished product if we possibly can. Um, the officials and my ministers uh, have been working over the weekend. We are like, well, I will be meeting them obviously on Tuesday when I get back. We're getting closer to coming up with a solution. But all I can say is that if we were to follow the approach that Phil Goff is talking about, we would end up in the position where we would be asking potentially those 12,000 homeowners to negotiate individually with both EQC and their own insurers. And I, for the life of me, cannot see how that would be a better outcome for the people of Christchurch. I think we'd, uh, yeah, we'd better take some Australian questions. <laughs> Uh, so we'll go to Kieran first, given yeah. I teased you about your jacket, that seems yeah. fair. Thanks, Pam. Prime Minister Key, um, in the context of the interoperability that you said the officials are working on with the emissions trading yeah. scheme, what do you make of the Coalition's uh, promise to roll back a carbon price? And Prime Minister Gillard, why not a plebiscite? Yeah. Well, look, in terms of the first one, it's simply just not for me to um, determine what is the right approach for Australia. I think we uh, acknowledge that every country has a different uh, profile in terms of their emissions and a different response. Uh, at the end of the day, our two economies are very closely linked, and if we can work together on this uh, problem of climate change, then I think that's a good thing. We already are working very closely together in the international markets in terms of the Global Greenhouse Gas Alliance and the coalition work that we're doing here in terms of uh, uh, into your coal storage uh, institute. So, look, and that we see that as a sensible way forward, but in the end, we'll leave that in, in the hands of the Australian politicians. Uh, and in answer to your question to me, I mean, this is an $80 million stunt from Tony Abbott. That's all it is. Uh, it's not leadership. Leadership requires you to define the problems of the future and to get about tackling them, and that's what we're doing. Um, on, uh, 
Day. The Australian opposition says that five years of sanctions and attempting to isolate the regime hasn't pushed Fiji any closer towards democracy. Do you think that New Zealand should reassess its approach and perhaps re-engage more closely with the regime? Yeah. So, look, I, th I think the first thing is that um, we need to acknowledge that there has been a coup culture that has developed in Fiji and now has been in place for the last 20 years. We've had four of them. For a country the size of Fiji and its significance in the Pacific, we don't think that's in the best long-term interests of the Pacific. So, in our view, um, we do need to make sure that there is pressure on Fiji to restore the country to democracy. I don't think in the case of either Australia or New Zealand we're taking a terribly heavy handed approach here. I mean, from New Zealand's perspective, we simply have travel sanctions on members of the regime uh, and family members that are closely related to that. Um, we haven't applied economic sanctions. We, for the most part, do give uh, waivers in terms of sporting contact and the like. So in my view, um, we are slowly making progress and these things always take some time. Uh, Frank Bainamarama has given a clear commitment that he intends to hold elections by 2014 and from New Zealand's perspective we expect him to honour that. Okay, well, I think we're due one more from Australia and then we'll uh, Thank allow you. Prime Minister Keita ready for uh, the lunch to come and the parliamentary address. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, animals Australia says it gave Joe Ludwig footage last year of Australian animals being mistreated in, Ku in Kuwait. Did your government receive it and do you think the response has been adequate? And Prime Minister Key, uh, given New Zealand's experience on this issue, do you think Australia does have anything to fear if it did go down uh, banning live exports? I haven't had the opportunity this morning to see the footage you refer to. Obviously, I've been engaged with Prime Minister Key in discussions. Uh, what I understand to be the case is that uh, Minister Ludwig was alerted to uh, footage of this nature last December. Uh, Minister Ludwig responded on animal welfare issues by saying to the industry in January that they needed to produce a better animal welfare plan. He received a response from them in March, which was inadequate. He received a response from them in May, which was still inadequate. Uh, since then, of course, we saw the revelations on Four Corners and the government has responded with the suspension of the trade to Indonesia and we are now taking the steps necessary to make sure we can track where Australian animals go uh, and we know the conditions under which they are being dealt with in abattoirs in Indonesia. Uh, we've also announced, of course, a more broadly based review, the Farmer Review, uh, which will look at the entirety of this trade, uh, all, all animals, all locations. Uh, but I will, of course, when I get an opportunity uh, specifically, direct my attention to this new footage. Uh, I'd, I'd want to understand exactly when it dates from and the circumstances that are there today uh, before providing you with any further response. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I'm cutting, cutting across the question to you. Well, actually, all I was going to say, look, it's a matter for the Australian government um, to determine how they want to respond to that issue. All I can say is that New Zealand uh, decided to stop the uh, live export of animals for slaughter in 2003. It does cause some frustration to our Middle Eastern trading partners, but it's a decision we're unlikely to reverse. And I think whilst we're all gathered together, it may be appropriate for the Australian journalists and New Zealand journalists to work out their own bet on the mm. World Cup. So exactly. it's not just us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well Prime Minister Julia Gillard.